welcome back. And today we're back to working on the Centurion. Most notably, we're working on this little drive right here. This is a CDC Finch drive, and it's not the first time that we've tried to get this drive going on this channel. Uh, the previous escapades with it didn't go well. <laughs> but before we get into the troubles that we're having with this drive and what we're going to do with it, let's rewind a little bit because it's been a hot minute and uh, recap what Centurion's history with CDC and their hard drives has been like. And the very first drive that Centurion used in their earliest systems was the Hawk drive. And that's this drive right here. And I have another one uh, just behind the camera over there in the Mini Centurion. Both of these actually work, which is kind of crazy. Uh, these were five megabyte fixed and five megabyte removable. So 10 megabyte drives in total. They weighed about 135 pounds and they're pretty epic to watch spin up. A little later, Centurion upgraded to the Phoenix, which is this drive right over here. This one came in a couple of different sizes, although this particular one is a 96 megabyte option that has 16 megabyte removable platters, which we have stacked up over there. Now, both of these drives used 14 inch platters. Looked just like this one right here. Now, if you're worried about me putting my fingerprints on this platter, don't worry, it's it's already been crashed. Uh, you never want to try and fly a crashed platter because it'll just exacerbate the problem and crash the heads even further, potentially destroying the heads in the process. But they used these absolutely huge platters. And of course, the trend in the industry was to get smaller and lighter. So the next logical step was to go from 14 inch platters down to eight inch platters. And CDC or Control Data Corporation did that with the Finch drive. There's a little bit of a theme going on here with bird names. We've got Hawk, Phoenix, and Finch. Uh, the Finch drive was quite a bit smaller, quite a bit lighter. This only weighs maybe uh, 20 or 30 pounds as opposed to 130 pounds. Uh, also, these came in a couple of different size options as well. There was, I believe, 20, 24, and 32 megabyte options. Uh, might be a little off on those numbers, but I believe this one is a 32 megabyte uh, option because it has three platters inside. Now there is a second Finch over here that only has two platters inside, so I think this is a 24 megabyte option, but these were still quite big. And Centurion used these particularly in the Micro Plus systems, but also used them in the big full-size cabinet systems. We got this one with the counterfeit system. It was in a separate box that looked pretty neat. It was a nice high storage, completely sealed option. Now, of course, CDC wanted to get even smaller and the next logical step after eight inches was five and a quarter inches, which is oh, what this guy is right here. This is a CDC or uh, magnetic peripherals RIN drive. That's W-R-E-N, RIN. Again, a bird name. But this used five and a quarter inch platters and I don't actually know how big this one is. I have no idea how much storage is on these. Uh, now, the RIN had a couple of different protocols that it used. The very early first generation RIN drives used the exact same pinout and protocol as the Finch drive. So they were actually interchangeable. So some models of the uh, Centurion Micro Plus actually came with RIN drives. However, the first generation RIN was only built for a very short amount of time and they very quickly changed over to the second generation RIN drive, which is what this one is. And it uses the same format as the uh, Seagate format, the ST 207 or whatever that number is. So unfortunately, I can't use this drive with our Finch floppy controller that's in our big Centurion. It would be awfully nice to have a somewhat modern five and a quarter in there, but well, I'm still hunting for the proper first generation Wren. So hopefully someday we'll find one. This one on the other hand is actually slated for use with uh, the PDP-11 potentially because it does share a format with what that thing can support. So those are the types of different drives that Centurion used, different hard drives that is. Centurion went bankrupt and bust long before three and a half inch hard drives were commonplace. So it was generally 14 inch, eight inch, or five and a quarter inch. And the five and a quarter inches were really late and they only used them for a very short amount of time. But we've got this Finch drive here and I really wanna get it going. So where are we on it? Uh, it's broken. As a matter of fact, this Finch drive is 
also broken. And where did both of these come from? Well, this one, as I said, came from the uh, counterfeit system that we got. It was in a separate box. This one came from a Micro Plus that is owned by Vintage Geek over in Tennessee. If you want to know more about this drive and the system that it came out of, I did actually a full video on my trip to Vintage Geek and how I came back with this thing. There is a link in the description below. But the goal is to get both of these finches going. However, they're both broken. And they're broken in different ways, which is good. It means we can actually cross-reference across each other. Because aside from the number of platters, they're almost identical. This one, the original one that we have, the 32 megabyte model, is mostly working. It spins up, it does its self-seek test, and then it sits over track zero waiting for commands from the controller card and waiting to send data back. But the controller card doesn't actually see the drive as existing. So what that means is that something is not making it out. Now this one over here, the one that came from Tennessee, it actually just has a dead short on the five volt rail on it. So it never actually powers up at all. So we've got work to do on both of these and we're gonna start with this one. And I think what is wrong with this one is that we have a bad line driver. In the previous episode, I took a bunch of scope shots but I didn't get to the point of showing them in the episode. So I'm showing them to you now. These are the scope shots that I took we have a clean byte clock coming into our line driver, which is an SN75110. This line driver is supposed to receive this byte clock and receive enable signals, which we can see that it is getting. It does have the correct enable signals coming in, and it's supposed to supply a differential signal out. Now, if we look at the uh, differential signal here on the bottom, you'll notice that it's not differential. Uh, for some reason, the outputs that are supposed to be opposite of each other are actually in phase. So the actual signal that the Finch floppy controller receives on the Centurion is bad. It thinks that the drive doesn't exist. So our first step, I think, is to replace this SN75110 and then give it another test. So I'm gonna pull out the desoldering iron, we're gonna pull that old chip out, put a socket in, put a new chip in, and spin it up one more time for the first time in a very long time. To get to the PCB, there are just four screws holding this backing plate in place. And with all four of those removed, it just pulls right off. And that gives us pretty good access to the back side of the PCB. But we need to get the PCB fully out. And in order to do that, there's one more screw right in the center. Uh, then we can go through and unplug each of the cables that connects the PCB to the motor and heads one by one. And this big ribbon cable in the back is always a pain. I'm just terrified I'm going to rip it in two. I hate this design of ribbon cable. But it came off and here is the PCB all free from the confines of the Finch. And if we look a little closer, we can see the SN75110IC that wasn't giving us proper differential outputs last time we had the scope on this. So in order to remove this IC, I start by adding a little solder onto each pin. Then I use my desoldering iron to suck the solder off of each connection. And I love this little desoldering iron. It works amazingly well. And with all of the pins desoldered, the IC needs just a little bit of persuasion and it comes right out. Then we'll clean up the PCB and solder in a new socket, making sure that we've got it nice and flat. Then finally, we just need to pop the new IC in place. Okay, new IC is in and we're gonna test it using the uh, real Centurion here. I've got the Diag card in with the auxiliary test menus up. On this test menu, I've always been able to pass the seek test, but never been able to pass the read test. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run the seek test followed by the read test. So I've got the lock off of ship and on to operate. I'm gonna flip the power switch. It should spin up, do a self test seek. And then once it's done with that, it's ready to run the test. So fingers crossed, here goes nothing. It's spinning up. Doesn't sound bad, that's good. It sounds like the bearings are nice and smooth.
The heads should have done a self-seek and they didn't. That's not good. All right, I think I may have narrowed in on another problem. Uh, this little regulator I see right here is a 7818. It takes a 24 volt input and gives a regulated 18 volts out. Uh, and even though it has this heat sink here, within seconds it becomes so hot that the heat sink itself almost burns your hand. It's a little ridiculous. Uh, we can check if it's actually regulating though. The leftmost pin is the input, that should be 24 volts. The middlemost should be ground, and then the rightmost pin, the one that's closest to me, should be the output at 18 volts. This little IC up here is also a 7818, so we can kind of use it as a reference. So I've got my uh, multimeter probes here. We'll pop the power on. And if we check this one up here, we can see it's regulating at 18 volts perfectly. If we check this one here, the output is 300 millivolts. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not correct. And, whoo boy, that's already getting hot. So I think we'll pull that one out and replace it and maybe that'll bring this thing back to life a little bit. The first step is removing the nut that holds the regulator IC down to the heat sink. Uh, then, again, just like before, I'll pull out my desoldering iron and suck the solder up on the three pins. But the uh, middle pin was being a little stubborn, so I just heated it up with a regular soldering iron and everything pulled right out with ease. And then finally, we'll just solder in the new 7818 regulator IC. All right, new regulator IC in. Uh, we're going to spin it up one more time. What we want to see is we want to see those heads do a uh, self-seek test. So here goes nothing. They did a self-seek test. We're ready to plug it back into the machine and see what happens. So we'll spin it down. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. We'll plug it into the machine and go. Okay, let's try this again. We're gonna spin it up and try to run the seek test, make sure that still works. And then we're gonna try and run the read test and fingers crossed everything works. Although I'm not expecting it because nothing's ever easy with CDC drives, but well, here goes nothing. The drive is spinning up. We should see it do its uh, self-seek test on here. It did its self-seek test. It sounds good. It's sitting over track zero. We'll do a seek test. That's going to be uh, zero F here. Yeah, I can see the heads seeking smoothly in and out. That works. So we're going to hit control C. It's going to come all the way back to track zero and then the, the test should finish up there. Pass. That's good. We're back up to where we were before. All right. This is the big one. The read test. One, zero, enter. Ooh, busy did not clear. That's, that might be better news. Okay, it's a little noisy in here because I've got both the Hawk and the Finch spun up at the same time. This is so I could get into the uh, question mark dot question mark Finch tests that are stored on the Hawk drive itself. These are a little more involved and give us a little more control. And we've discovered a lot of really interesting things. First of all, contrary to like pretty much every drive out there, track zero is the innermost track on the Finch. Uh, whenever you do an RTZ, it always goes to the innermost. Whenever you tell it to seek specifically to track zero, it also goes to the innermost. So that's a little weird, but not, <laughs> I guess, it doesn't particularly matter all that much. All that matters is that we've got a track zero. Uh, however, we're not getting any data off of that track zero, which is why it always seems to fail. Now, interestingly, when, when it does fail, when it gives us the busy did not clear, everything stays asserted. So the drive is still acting as if though it's selected and trying to give out data. 
So we can check a couple of signals in this state. Uh, the first is we can check an index signal. That's one of the most important signals that can come off of the drive. So that is gonna be on pin 20 here. So if I count down, right there, we have our index pulse right here. Seems to be running at 60 Hertz. That's, I guess, I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's what the index pulse is at. But we have a good index pulse coming in. So that's good news. Next, we wanna make sure that drive ready is low. So that's gonna be pin 22. And drive ready is indeed low. So this is an active low signal. So if it were high, that would tell us that the drive was not ready. But the Finch is telling the FFC controller card that, hey, I'm ready for command signals. Now on the second ribbon cable down here, we can check a couple of things. The first is servo. Now the uh, servo clock is going to be a differential signal, so it's a little difficult to check with the scope probe here, but that's on pin 15 and pin 16. So we should see a little something up here coming off of those pins. And it's small, it's about one volt peak to peak, but pin 15 and pin 16 do have something showing up on them. Uh, and one volt peak to peak, even though it's differential, means that it now becomes two volt peak to peak, and that sounds about right. So we've got a drive ready. The drive is absolutely ready. We've got a good servo signal going in there. We just, we don't have any data and we can actually check that on pens 18 and 19. Again, differential signal, uh, but if we check it, um, so totally dead. We're not getting any data at all out of our data differential output. Now, at first I was thinking that this was a fault of the Finch but uh, talking with some people on the Discord, there was one more signal I needed to check, and that is read enable. The FFC is going to see the index, going to see the servo clock, and it's gonna tell the Finch, hey, turn your read enable on so I can start receiving data. If that read enable never goes on, the Finch will never output data. It's gating that data on the way out. So read enable is pin four on the command cable up here. And if we look at that, pin four is high all the time. Read enable never gets asserted. Read enable should be low. When read enable goes low, that's gonna allow our data to start coming out. So we've hit an interesting spot. The Finch itself might be totally fine and we might have a failure on the FFC. So <laughs> the next step is to spin all of this junk down so I can pull the FFC out, put it on the extender card, prop it up some way, and then start probing around on it. All right, it's getting a little late in the day and I was kind of procrastinating on pulling the FFC out and starting to probe around on it with the scope, but Meisaka over on the Discord had a brilliant idea. Uh, she said, why not just use one of the other Finch ports? Uh, the, the FFC card has four ports on it. It can support one floppy and up to three Finch drives. If the Finch is actually totally fine, but we have a bad receiver chip on the FFC, well, one of the other ports might actually be totally fine. So right now I'm over on port three. I've got both the drives spun up. I got into the uh, question mark Finch uh, diagnostic tests. I already ran the seek test, so I know that I've got everything hooked up correctly and we're right back up to where we were. So let's run the read test and see what happens. Uh, so we'll just hit R here for read test. We'll do track. Uh, the drive is actually two. Uh, we'll do disk number zero. The seek pattern we'll just do is A. Our low track and hex will be zero, zero, zero. Uh, and then our high track will be 200. We'll hit enter. The printer will hit enter on this. I can hear it seeking. <laughs> That's all. <awesome. laughs> We're passing a seek test. Oh man, we'll see if I can get the camera to focus on this. So there we go, we, we <laughs> passed a read test for the first time ever. There's only one thing left to do now and that's to get into the OS and see what the OS thinks of the drive. <laughs> so I'm gonna bring the camera in a little closer, get the nice camera on the screen. I'm gonna kick the lights off so you guys can actually see the screen really easy. And let's get back into the OS and see what happens. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, hit the reset button here. We'll type H1 at the D equals prompt here. That's gonna try and boot us into the operating system. We should see a max disk equals some no number other than one here. Nope. <laughs> Shit. 
All right, I've been thinking about this. I think what we gotta do is we gotta actually register two more Finch drives. So let's hop into the SysGen utility here. Uh, our configuration name is at OSN. Uh, the disk number is one. This is our uh, system configuration utility. So we'll do number four to go to disk drives here. Uh, and you can see I've got uh, the floppy set up and one finch, but we'll go ahead and add in two more finches. So now we have disk zero, one, two, three, four, and five. That should be enough finches for the operating system to see it. So <laughs> we'll get out of this by doing control B, four, enter, uh, then end program. No. Okay, now we gotta reset one more time. I'll hit the load ops this button. We'll type H1. Uh, again, now we should see uh, something other than uh, max disk equal one. Max disk equal five. <laughs> That's good news, we're making progress. Okay, uh, 082384. Okay, we're, in, we're into the operating system, CRT0, let's do a .sta. DIR5. <laughs> oh my god. It works. Like a year, I've been thinking that this thing's broken. Turns out we've got a fault on the FS. <laughs> I can't form coherent thoughts. Oh my God. Okay, there's so much stuff on here. There's so much stuff on here. Uh oh, we stopped. Oh, it took it a second. Okay. <laughs> Look at the size. Used 4,156, available 219. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they stacked this thing full of data. We got to figure out a way to dump all this. I have no idea how, but it doesn't matter because it freaking works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what did we find on the drive? Well, I have a full directory listing here printed out and uh, it's really mostly boring files. There's, <laughs> there's nothing really exciting on there. Um, there are a ton of files in here that start with the letter O, and I think that uh, corresponds to it being part of the oil and gas package. Uh, and we actually can kind of confirm that. There's one file on here called OBM1, and this is really fascinating. This is a purely text-based file, but I think it's just actually a backup output by the oil and gas package. And the reason I'm pretty confident it's oil and gas is because if we look at the actual items over here on the right, some of them are really interesting. A replaced two and a half inch flow line, repair leak, put belts on unit, repair engine number one, a haul off oily dirt and replace with fresh dirt. That's a uh, pretty interesting one. Uh, looking at all this stuff in here, it all absolutely points to the oil and gas industry. And we actually found that in one more file as well. Uh, the Centurion creates these temporary files whenever you're doing something, usually. Uh, and a lot of times those temporary files have a name like at SCR0. Uh, and this is at SCR0. There was actually something still remaining in this temporary file and there is a name. It's McCommons Oil Company, uh, located here in Dallas. And if we do a little bit of Googling, we can actually find some information about McCommons Oil Company. So that's really cool. We now know who used this machine. So that's really fascinating. We figured out a ton about the history of the machine from just a few files, but well, if it's all just oil and gas stuff and I'm not an oil and gas company, that's all kind of boring stuff. So is there really anything super exciting on there? And there is, there was actually two folders on there. One of them was called year end, super boring, don't care about their year end stuff. But there was another one called ZOL. Uh, and I have the uh, directory listing of it right here. And it's just pure ASCII files that all start with the letter Z. And talking with Ken, that is an indication that these are potentially source code files for something. 
Now, what are they source code files for? Well, that's what I was trying to figure out. So I opened up ZOA here and started dumping the contents, starting to back up these files. And uh, this is ZOA. And we were looking through it and it was awesome. And then all of a sudden on page three, it was in the middle of dumping and it aired out. We got uh, in our space disk five, and it just continues to air completely like that. So is the file bad? Well, no. This is the answer to the big burning question, which is why am I showing you all of this information on pieces of paper that I've printed out instead of on the actual machine with the actual drive hooked up? And that's because the drive died while we were backing up files. It had a total uptime of about 30 minutes before it kicked the bucket. Now, I don't think that the heads have crashed. I am like 95% certain that the platters are still good, the heads are still good, and we still have good data on there. Because if I get the scope out, I still get a clean index signal and a clean byte clock coming out of the data cable here on the bottom. However, that index signal never makes it up to here to the command cable, which is where the FFC is going to be reading it from. And that's because the drive ready signal never goes low. So for some reason, some IC on this uh, Finch PCB lunched itself and the drive never comes up to being drive ready, which is what NR disk five stands for, means not ready disk five. So our Finch drive is broken yet again. All of that celebration, maybe I celebrated a little too hard, but uh, we know that there's good data on there. We know there's some source code that we definitely want to back up. The rest of it we don't really care too much about, but it would be nice to have a backup of it anyways. So we've got to get this drive up and going one more time. And that's what we're going to do in the next episode of this series. Uh, for now, I'm going to uh, edit this video back up so you guys can watch it because it's already getting quite long. And then I'm going to slowly poke away at this and try to reverse engineer as much as I can to figure out why our drive is never becoming ready. And then once we got it up and working again, we'll start ripping the data off of it. And then we'll use this one as a baseline for the 24 megabyte Finch from Tennessee and get it up and going as well. I have no idea how far we'll get in that next episode, but we're gonna keep working on this whenever we come back around to it. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.